I bless God in heaven. I will thank you very much tonight for Bible study. I will thank you for the help and the assistance and the influence of your spirit. Every time we come, so that your spirit will throw light on the word that we're studying. And Lord, we pray that you'll do what you always do and enlighten your people tonight in Jesus' name. We have to know, Lord, that your word should be will reach every heart, touch everyone, turn us around, influence us, and lead us in the right direction as we learn from your word tonight in Jesus' name. Be glorified in our lives, O Lord. Help us to know who are members of your, of your church and living stones in the temple of the living God. And Lord, as living stones, we pray that life will live, the things we do, our profession of faith will be according to the testimony of your word in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight and help us, Lord, as we be faithful witnesses of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We are all welcome to the Bible study tonight once again. Tonight we are looking at First Peter chapter 2. We studied from verse 1 to verse 3 last week that tells us we are laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and, and envies and evil speaking as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby. It so be that she has tasted that the Lord is gracious. We have learned from those verses of scripture that she, the apostle is being used of the Spirit of God to speak to believers. These believers are being referred to as children of God in chapter 1. In fact, in chapter 1, it refers to them in verse 14. It says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your former ignorance. These people that are receiving the epistle were reading, were studying together. They were the children of God. Not only that they were children of God, but to be obedient children of God. They knew God as Father. In verse 17 of chapter 1 it says, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges according to every man's word, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. These were the people that can be born again. And as they were born again, that's why they were called newborn babes. Look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It was the word of God that helped them, that assisted them, that made them to know their condition as sinners. And also the Savior, who is our Lord, who leads us in relationship, reconciliation with the Father. And then who brings us now in real relationship righteousness to the Father. And then he says we are born again. How then are we to live? We look at verse 22, chapter 1. See, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Through the faith unto unfeigned love. Of the brethren, see that she love one another with a pure heart, fervently. These were the people that have come to know the Lord. That's why he said, now you new found faith, and a new life, and a fact that you are new creatures in Christ, you lay aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, all envies, and all evil speaking. What are we now to desire? It says, as new, as newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of the world so that we can grow thereby. That will be the evidence that we have known the Lord whose grace has brought us to Him. That brings us now to verse 4. Verse 4 through to verse 10. Open your Bible with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone. Is allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer all spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect. Precious, 
and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which the disobedient the stone, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the hedge of a corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of faith, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. As you go back to verse 5, it says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and only priesthood to offer all spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That then tells us the topic we're looking at today, lively stones in a spiritual temple. Peter had reached to the believers on our individual experience of salvation. Now, he was instructing, at this time in chapter 2, instructing us on our collective privilege in salvation. The individual Christian experiences salvation so that he can be part of the church of the living God, that is, to become part of the spiritual temple. The newborn babe is not just an individual, he is a member of a family, the family of God. Just like in a natural family, when somebody is born into the family, baby child is born into the family. Yes, it's an individual, but that individual is a member of that family. The same thing with the family of God, where individual believers, by repentance, by turning away from sin, and coming unto the Lord, then will become children of God. But as children of God, we come into the family of God. We're not isolated. We come to that body, the body of Christ. As there is a change of emphasis, also there's a change of imagery. We have been using the metaphor in chapter 1 of the siege, and then in chapter 2 of the babe in Christ. Now he uses another metaphor, and he says, what are the stones? He says, what builds up a spiritual house. He says, we become a holy priesthood, and then we offer sacrifices unto the Lord. He points out our privilege and position in Christ, and then our redemption as well as our responsibility. Our redemption that redeems us, redeems us from sin, and redeems us from Satan, and redeems us from all the wars of the devil. Then our responsibility, that word responsibility is divided into two, that's responsibility. Our ability to respond to what Christ has done, because he redeems us. Then we have a responsibility, that is, we now have ability to respond to the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we consider the metaphor of the temple, then you understand, as Peter would under, understood as a Jew, and his readers, many of them being Jews, as they would have understood, because the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices were most honored, it was sacred in the sight of the children of Israel in the Jewish system. The Jews worshipped in the temple. Now we are the temple. And the Jews also made sacrifices. But we are now offering sacrifices unto God. Because although a few of them were priests, we are now all priests unto the Lord. It says we have a living relationship with Christ. He is the living stone, and we are the lively stones. Our relationship with Christ is described as precious, as living, as royal, as holy, and as peculiar. Look at verse 9. But she are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. What are we to do then? That we should offer, we should show for us the praises of him who has called us, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
As you look at uh, this uh, chapter, in particular, you will see how the children of God are dressed. You will see how the children of God are described. Number two, it says, number one, we are newborn babes. Then you jump down to verse five. It says, we are now lively stones. And then in that same verse, it says, we're speaking to our house. In that same verse five, we're holy Christian. And then we offer spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. You see then, there's a change that has taken place. A change, you're no more a sinner. You're now a sage. You're no more a child of the devil. You're now a child of God. You're no more outside the kingdom of God. You're now in the kingdom of God as children of God. You're no more an isolated stone outside a stumbling block to all the people. You have now become a living stone built up into the spiritual temple that we are now worshipping the Lord together. Verse 9, it says we are a chosen generation. And then we are royal priesthood. And then we are holy nation. We are a peculiar people. What do you learn about the believer? As we look at this chapter, as we put together all those things that we have learned now. Number one, we are changed. It's a change. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. We are changed, we are converted. Things are different now. We are not what we used to be. We don't go where we used to go. We don't say what we used to say. We don't dress the way we used to dress. We don't eat or drink or smoke how we used to smoke in the past. But now there is a change in our nature, a change in our life, a change in our character. Number one, we are changed. Number two, we are cherished. We are cherished. It brings us out of where we are. And it brings us to the part of the holy temple. We are loved. We are now lovely, we are loving, we are loved by the Lord. In fact, as you look at other parts of this epistle and the other epistles, you'll find we are called beloved many, many times. We are the beloved of the Lord. We are cherished. Number three, we are chosen. We are selected. Because He picked us out of where we were. And then He brings us now into the holy temple. And we are chosen. And would you remember that, that you are not just an ordinary fellow, you are extraordinary because the Lord has chosen you. And then number four, we are chisels. Chisels. What that means is, as the Lord is building the temple, have you seen uh, those amazes, those who are building? You see they take a block, and they want to fix that block into its place. And if the block is too big for that place, or it's not having the right shape to fit into the place, it's supposed to fit the chisel out the rough edges. And the chisel out the corners. How many rough edges we have in our personal life? As you look at your personal life, and the Lord wants to fit you into the body of Christ, or into his family, or into their spiritual temple. The rough edges in your language, the rough edges in your conversation. The rough edges in your lifestyle, that if the Lord were to leave you the way you are, with your mind, with your will, with your opinions, with your ideas, and with your idiosyncrasies, with your peculiarities, the Lord says, no, it can't be like that. Therefore, it chisels out quite a lot of areas in your life, so you can feed into the family of God, into their spiritual house. Number one, change, transform. And then number two, you are cherished and loved. Number three, you are chosen. Number four, you are chiseled, you are caused to size. And then number four, you are cemented. You see, when, when you find those mazes, mazes as they are building, and they are putting block upon block, they don't, they don't just start the blocks as they are. They put the cement, the glue, to unite those blocks together. And it's a love, one to another. It's the affection, one for another. Is the appreciation one for another, and it is what we do one to another as we interact together, link our hearts and heads and minds together. We are actually glued together, joined together, cleaving together, united together. We are cemented, cemented together, and that's why we will now have a church. We become a church, become a chapel, we become a temple, and we become the house of God whereby we are offering worship unto the Lord, praises unto the Lord, even now, number seven, then we face a challenge, we are challenged. If this is what God has done, 
that you are no more an isolated individual. To do your own thing, your own way, wherever you want, however you want it, that you cannot do that anymore. What's a challenge? That we are now to live, not as isolated Christians or believers, we are now to live as real children of God, fam- members of the family of God. We well, invite the study tonight to pray past number one. Christians build up into a spiritual temple. Christians built up into a spiritual temple. Number two, Christ, the cornerstone of the spiritual temple. Christ, the chief cornerstone of the spiritual temple. Number three now, we have the characteristics of our priesthood in the spiritual temple. Let's come back to First Peter chapter 2, reading from verses 4 and 5. To whom come as unto a living stone, this allows in this of men, but chosen of God and precious. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer all spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. As you look at those two verses of Scripture, it talks about Christ, the cornerstone, the leading stone, and then it talks about the believers, the Christians, and it talks about us as the lightly stones. But then it talks about the characteristics of them, what makes us the lightly stones that we are. It says in verse 4, to whom coming, we're coming unto him, as unto a leading stone. As we come to him, then the impact and the influence and inspiration coming from him makes a change, a definite change in our lives. And then makes us in verse 5, he also has lively stones. Now we become lively stones because we come unto him. Think of that word, come. You've heard from me before that that's a verb. And a verb is a word of action. That means, as you come to the Lord, you have to come before that change can take place. And it is when you come, the conversion will take place, the regeneration will take place, and uh, the good thing the Lord wants to do in your life, that's when it will take place. You come. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, I'm reading from verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. That's what we do. Come in unto him as a living stone. You come. Come, it turn your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him, referring to Christ, a Savior, a Redeemer, our Lord. I behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation. That thou knew that thou knowest not, and nations that knew thee not shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified thee. When it says in verse 3, come, what's the practical implication of coming? How do you translate that? How do you explain that? If you were to tell somebody who is not a Christian, who is not a member of the body of Christ, who oh, is not a real babe yet in the family of God. If you were to tell him how to come, how to become a child of God, how to become part of the family of God, what will you tell him? That's what was told in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. The word forsake and the word come, you see, relationship, the sinner was somewhere. And where he was is not acceptable to God. What he was being is not acceptable to God. Where he is or was he has been involved with is contrary, opposed to the will of God and the word of God. What he to do is to leave that place and come to the Lord. What another word for that? To forsake where he was and what he was being. And then come and build up a relationship for the Lord. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. His way, his thoughts. Any connection? Yes. As a man thinking in his heart, so is he. Your thoughts determine your action. And your action show or reveal your character. 
And so as you possess your way, your weighted way, then you also possess your thoughts, the thoughts that lead to sinful action. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's how we come to the Lord. That's how we know the Lord. That is how we make reconciliation with the Lord and we become living stones to become part of this wonderful temple of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. Return, ye but sliding children. Again, it's, it's, not, it's talking now to people who were inside in the family before. But like the prodigal son. Now the prodigal daughter of prodigal son had gone away from the family. And the Lord is still interested in every member, everyone that had been a member of the family of God before. He says, return. Like the prodigal son, return. Return, thou backsliding children, ye backsliding children, and I will kill your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee. That's the word come again. You know what we are putting? We are putting the word come because we are bred in First Peter chapter 2 verse 4. As coming unto the living, lively stone. And then that's coming, you are being a backslider, you need to come. You are a sinner, you never knew the Lord, you have to come. It says, Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. In verse 23, truly, in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly, in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. There's no other name whereby we can be saved except that name that Almighty God Himself has exalted. That is the name of Jesus Christ. And it says, it's in that name we trust. We put our faith in that name. And as you come in faith to that name, then you become saved and your life is turned around. You become a child of God. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, the word come. Come. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord is saying, we shall come unto him. We will be laboring, laboring, uh, trying to find. And maybe we will labor to the righteous. But by laboring, we cannot find true righteousness. We labor to have peace of mind. By laboring, we cannot have the peace of mind. We labor to have all the guilt and the condemnation in our hearts taken away. By laboring, we cannot have that done. That's why the Lord says, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor. And I will lady, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. My yoke is what? Many people say, you know, the Christian life so tough, so difficult. When well, you try to live the Christian life in your own strength. It shall appear difficult. The challenge is great. That's tough. But when you live that Christian life in the grace of God, by the strength of the Lord, by the abiding presence, the dwelling presence of Christ, with you, you'll find about what He said My yoke is easy, and my body is light. It tells us we're still chasing and pursuing the world. Come. Come to the Lord. Come to Him and find rest. Come to Him and find peace. Come to Him and find salvation. Come to Him and find favor with God. In John chapter 6, verse 37. John chapter 6, reading from verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. And the Father gives us to Him. So the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come unto him. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He rejects none. He rejects none. And as you come today, the Lord will receive you. And you can tell your friends, let them come. Tell your neighbors, let them come. As they come, the Lord will receive them, get you. They will become part of this body of Christ. Let's come back to First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed in deeds of men, but chosen of God and precious, he also as lively stones, are built up his spiritual house, 
when you come to the Lord, then He builds you up for the rest of the lively stones, and then you become part of the holy temple. Christ is the living stone, the foundation stone, and we come unto Him for salvation. Peter did not count himself as the foundation of the church. You know, there are people that erroneously teach that Peter was the chief cornerstone of the church because they take him as the, as the first pope. And then all the other posts following, uh, they follow after, according to them, the uh, apostolic succession. Uh, he was the first pope, and then all the other posts are following after his posters. And it comes to him to be the, uh, the chief cornerstone of the church. But the Bible doesn't say that Christ is the foundation of the church, the chief cornerstone. And we come to him by faith. Those who come to Christ, coming away from all their sins, coming to him as their Savior, will be transformed and their lives are going to be totally different. Formerly, they were dead in sins and trespasses, but now we are lively stones in Christ. We are transformed to be like him. He is the living stone. Then we come to him and we become the lively stone. He is the son of God. We are the sons of God. He is the light of the world and we shine as lights in the world. I come back to this first Peter. Chapter, chapter 2. Reading from verse 5. He also are lively stones. I pointed out already that... Uh, this passage and all the passages refer to believers by various titles and names. And the names by which we are referred to was so actually a lifestyle. What we become and the grace that we have, the strength that we have, number one, were referred to as lively stones. Number two, as lovely sons. We're sons of God. And when you're thinking of us as a family, we are lovely sons or beloved sons. As if you're thinking about us as a temple, then we are lively stones. If you're thinking about us as a flock, because it was something to refer to Jesus Christ as a shepherd, and then we are the flock of his fold, then we become lowly sheep. We're the lowly sheep. On the one hand, number one, lively stone. Number two, sons. Number three, lowly sheep. That means a sheep in the fold. We are obedient to the shepherd. We follow after the shepherd. And we are lowly. We are humble. And we are meek. Because we are sheep. Number, number four, we are lighting saints. We are the saints of God. You see, he changes us. He turns us. He transforms us. That we are no more sinners, but we are saints. Well, you want to compare what we are today with what we used to be. We're thinking then of saints and we're lighting saints. That is, we have been enlightened by the words of the Lord. And the light of the gospel coming to us makes us not sinners, but we are saints. Number five, we are offering living sacrifice. And we're living sacrifice ourselves. In Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, reading from verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see who we are? Different names, different titles, telling us the characteristics that we have, the lifestyle that we have. Number six, we are laboring servants. We are the servants of God, and we are laboring for Him. And the labor he has given us to do is to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go preach the gospel to every creature. And then number seven, we're loyal stewards. We're loyal stewards. We're faithful unto him. He has called us. He has given us a work to do. And we're the stewards of the mysteries of God. And we must be loyal and faithful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Let him answer account of us. As of the ministers of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. As you come back to First Peter chapter two, we will be referred to as lively stones. We're coming back to First Peter chapter two, verse five. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. We're built up. A spiritual house. None of us, after experiencing the grace of salvation, 
to remain as isolated individuals. Christ is building his church. And as soon as anyone is saved, he is brought into the spiritual house, built into the spiritual house. The individual Christian finds fulfillment and divine purpose as he finds his true place when he is built into the spiritual edifice. A solitary Christian who refuses to be part of an assembly or a fellowship of believers in the church is out of the will of God. So long as a brief lies isolated by itself, it will be useless. It becomes only of use when it is incorporated into a building. So it is for the individual Christian to realize his destiny. He must not remain alone or isolated. He must be built into the fabric of the church. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 20 through to verse 22, telling us that we are built into this temple as part of the temple of God. Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together. Ye also, you Christians, you believers, you lively stones, are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. That's the will of God. That's what He wants for us to become a temple of the Lord. And the temple is not just a single stone. The lot of stones together, cemented together, united together, structured together to form a temple, a building that honors and glorifies God. In First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, ye, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We we'll become people of God and we honor and glorify the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 13, it tells us what we now offer to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. By him therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our leaves, giving signs to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That's our calling then. That's the expectation of the Lord. We come to Christ as a living stone. We repent, we believe on the Lord, we are converted, we become lively stone. We're saved, all our sins are forgiven, and then we're given a new, a new life. We have eternal life. We're selected and set apart for the service of God. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, I read verse 7 as well as verse 21. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, believers are called by his name. Christ, Christians. The living stone, we are lively stones. He is the light of the world, we are light shining in the world. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. Do you understand? They say you are created, and they say you are recreated, is so that you will be formed, will shine forth, reveal the glory of God, and have formed him, yea, I have made him. In verse 21, these people have I formed for myself, not for yourself, not for the society, and not for any other scene, any other one, but these people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. That's the will of God. And I pray the Lord will fulfill that in your life and in my life in Jesus' name. As a stone made lively by the power of God and the grace of God will become solid and strong. Then we're able to support the weight of all the stones in the spiritual house. Number two, we're stable and steadfast. Because 
He has come. Because we have come to Christ to stay, not to backslide, not to fall away. Number three, every stone, each stone is shaved and chiseled to fit into the final building without the sound of a hammer or axe or any other tool of iron. And then we're told that each stone is number four set and cemented in the building as it pleases God. The Lord sets us in the body as it pleases Him. The stones in the, in the temple or in the building, they are set by the Lord. And where the Lord has put us is where we ought to stay. There shouldn't be any canal comparison. There shouldn't be any canal competition. The Lord has said, everyone has a place in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 18. But now, as God said, the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased Him, the Lord has put us where we are, as members of the church. How about the ministers? Go down to verse 28. And God has set some in the church. Not everybody, but some. First, apostles. Secondly, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, the gifts of healing. And then, health and governments and diversities of tongues. They have said both the members and the ministers. And what you unite together to keep on serving the Lord, offering spiritual praises unto God which is acceptable unto him. We'll come to point number two. Christ, the cornerstone of the spiritual temple. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 again. To whom come as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. It tells us the attitude of the people of the world. What it says of men here is referring to the men in the world, the people of the world, the unbelievers in the world. What's the attitude of Christ? It says is uh, in that verse 4, disallowed of men. What's the meaning of that? That means disapproved by men. They won't approve of him. They won't accept him. That means disqualified by men. They don't accept him that was qualified to be the Messiah. That's the, that's the bone of contention among the Pharisees, among the Sadducees, and the members of the Sanhedrin. He was disqualified by them. What does that mean? Denied by them. No, we know him now. Moses is our leader. As for this fellow, that's what he said, we don't know about him. It's all that fellow that was a born blind who said, Eyes, the Lord Jesus Christ opened and said, As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. But he is a sinner in any case, but Moses is the one we know. They denied him. But it says over here that even though they disallowed him, indeed of men, but chosen of God, appointed by God, accepted by God, approved by God. And look at the Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And you'll see the approval of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was accepted by the Father. We're told in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. A man approved, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. In the midst of you, as ye you yourselves also know, accepted by the Father, appointed by the Father, approved by the Father, anointed by the Father. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, we're reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went out straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, accepted, appointed, approved, anointed. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, we're looking at verse 38. 
R for the ten, verse 38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth of the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all the corpus of the devil, for God was with him. Come back to First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 again. It says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. But says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay Zion a chief cornerstone, a ledge precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord says that he has laid that stone, that chief cornerstone, in that appropriate place, and he will believe in him, will be saved, will not be ashamed, will not be confounded, will not be confused, will not be condemned. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 10. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here be before you hold. This is the stone, the chief cornerstone. This is the stone, the lively stone, the living stone. This is the stone which was set at naught, disallowed of men, which was set at naught, at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Only in that name is there salvation. Only in that name is there forgiveness. Only in that name is there reconciliation with God. Only in that name do we have eternal life, everlasting life. Only in that name do we escape the judgments of God, and then we have eternal fellowship with the Almighty God. In Psalm 118, Psalm 118, reading from verse 22. Psalm 118, verse 22. In Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the hedge of the corner. You remember what we read in First Peter chapter 2? This is the stone. This allows indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And the sun saw that ahead of time. Many, many years, almost about 1,000 years before Christ came. And it said in this verse 22, The stone which the builders refuse, refuse, is become the hedge stone of a corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Isaiah spoke about the same thing, that this Christ rejected of men is received by people who know the Lord. The people whose heart the Lord had touched. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28, reading from verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay Zion, a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Come back to First Peter chapter 2 verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. That means Isaiah is referred to a scripture. It is contained in the scripture. Behold I lay Zion a chief cornerstone a ledge precious and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Isaiah chapter 8, 15. is a scripture that interprets scripture. It's a scripture that throws light on other parts of scripture. Chapter 8 of Isaiah, verse 14. And it shall be for his sanctuary, but for his stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. For a gene, a gene, and 
for is near to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. What he's saying is what you have in First Peter chapter 2. It is precious. For those who are saved, Christ is precious. For those who have the grace of God coming through Christ to them, Christ is precious. For those whose life have been transformed and now you are a new creature in Christ, He is precious. For those who pray in the name of Jesus, and our prayer is answered because we pray in that name. He is precious. For those who know him, and he know that we have escaped judgment, and we have come unto reconciliation, and then we have come unto the rewards of faith, then we know that he is precious unto you. Therefore we believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, unto them that disregard Christ, unto them who disbelieve Christ, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the edge of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. I pray we will not be appointed to judgment. In Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Verses 17 and 18. In Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18, still following after what Peter, the Apostle Peter, is teaching us, instructing us with, Luke chapter 20, verse 17. He tells us very clearly, it says, And he beheld them and said, What is this? Then, that is written, the stone which the builders rejected. The same is become the edge of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but upon whom ever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. Here was the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the unbelieving Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the teachers of the law. He said, You have missed what was written. And because you don't understand what has been reaching, that is why you are stumbling, and the stumbling stone, they stumbled at him, because they did not believe the scriptures they were reading and teaching. In Romans chapter 9, reading from verse 30, Romans chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 30, what shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness, that is self-righteousness? For the righteousness of the law in the Old Testament, they have attained unto, unto righteousness. That's the righteousness of faith, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, they were religious, but they were not righteous before the Lord. They were following after the law of righteousness, the Mosaic law. They have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and rock of offense, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the chief cornerstone. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. That is the foundation. Both Christ and Peter identified Jesus Christ as the stone which was set at naught by the builders, which is become the head of the corner. The Old Testament used that symbol or metaphor of the stone for the Messiah, the coming Christ. He was appointed by God as the chief cornerstone to occupy the most honorable and important place in the building of the eternal kingdom. He was rejected by the Jews, but and today he is still rejected by men. Yet in the plan of God, in the purpose of God, he is the cornerstone of the edifice of the kingdom, exalted by God the Father and honored above all. This divine appointment of the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the human rejection 
has been prophesied in the scriptures. We've read it in, in Isaiah, and this is what is quoted on your plan. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, for a foundation is stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make his. He shall be for a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. And many among them, among the children of Israel, among the unbelievers, among the Gentiles, shall fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. I pray you'll be a believer. Though yeah. Israel rejected Christ, and many are rejecting him to this chill, this Jesus Christ is a precious, immovable foundation stone appointed by God to those who accept Jesus Christ. He is the Savior and He is the Lord. To those who reject Him, He is the judge who will condemn and appoint them to eternal punishment. Some erroneously uh, teach that Peter is the foundation, the foundation stone of the church. But Peter himself affirms that Christ is that foundation stone. And I pray that we we'll believe the scripture, let all men be liars and let Jesus Christ be true and let God be true in Jesus' name. We we'll come to point number three now. When I want to look at the characteristics of a priesthood in the spiritual temple. We come to First Peter chapter 2. We read verse 5, verse 9, and verse 10. Verse 5. Ye also, ye also, as lively stones, have built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. He said, ye also, who are these ye also? Come back to chapter 1. It's the furniture of the believers. And it says, Ye also, who are they? Chapter 1, verse 2. He led according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. These are the people who have been placed by the sprinkling of the blood of the Lamb. And then they have come to believe on the Lord, and the grace of God has come into their lives, and they are living obedient lives unto the Lord. It tells us in verse 14, as obedient children, when it says, Ye also, these are the ye also, these are the people of God, these are the members of the family of God, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves. According to your former laws, in your ignorance, who are these people? Verse 15 and verse 16. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Who are these people? Verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. These are the people who are born again. These are the people who are children of God. That's why it says in verse 5, Ye also as lively stones. And look, look more at the description, verse 2 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire, this is the same milk of the world, that she may go thereby. These are the people that have been born into the kingdom. They are born again. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see, cannot enter the kingdom of God. And these have been born again. That's why it says you are newborn babes. And then they have a desire, a passion for the milk of the word of God. And they have a desire to grow in the Lord. Then you go to verse 9. Ye are a chosen generation. These are people that are chosen to belong to the Lord. You are chosen generation, a royal priesthood. They come into the family of the king. You are a royal priesthood. They are priests and they are also kingly or royal before the Lord. And holy nation. They become holy by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. A peculiar people that ye should show forth this is the purpose of our salvation. The purpose of knowing the Lord, the purpose of being regenerated, being born again, that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Have you noticed those words, out of and then into? Out of and then into. You always find that because that makes a transition, a translation. 
that brings the transformation. You are out of darkness, and then you come into the marvelous light of the Lord, which in time past were not a people, were not the people of God. But now he tells us, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy in the past, but now have obtained mercy. True believers have been placed by the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, and are now a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. The Christian, who is now a priest, has access to God, and his task is to bring others to the Lord. In the Old Testament, this access to God was the privilege of only a few people. The priest and the high priest in particular, who alone could enter into the Holy of Holies, through Jesus Christ, the new and the living way. Access to God becomes the privilege of every born again Christian. Now he knows that he knows Christ as Savior, and has the privilege and the responsibility of bringing others to the Savior. As a Christian, you are a priest unto God. You are, you are now bringing spiritual sacrifices to God. You make yourself an offering to God, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You offer your will to the Lord. Henceforth, accepting the will of God to overrule your own will. That's number one thing. You see, the characteristic of the sinner is that he has his own self-will, his own stubbornness, his own opinion, and is consecrated and committed to his opinion. Me and no one else. My opinion and nobody else. Just that will, and is committed to that. But now when you become a child of God, your will is swallowed up in the will of God. You offer your will to God, henceforth accepting only the will of God to overrule your will. Number two, you offer your work and your labor of love unto the Lord, doing good unto all men, especially unto, unto them who are the household of faith. For with such sacrifices were told, God is well pleased. Number one, your will offered to God. Number two, your work offered to God. Number three, your worship offered to God. You are a Christian and therefore you make your worship an offering unto the Lord. Offering the sacrifice of praise unto God continually. That's what we have read about in that verse 9. When it says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you will show for the presence of him who has called you uh, out of darkness into his marvelous light. These great privileges were first given to Israel, but now they are fulfilled in the church. Israel was to enjoy these privileges only if he will obey my voice indeed and keep my statutes or keep my covenant. And let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Peculiar people. Peculiar people. Now we're told that we're peculiar. A royal nation. A, a holy nation. A chosen nation. A peculiar people unto the Lord. The children of Israel first had that privilege before the lost age. And the condition of having that privilege is that there will be the voice of the Lord indeed. Exodus chapter 19, reading verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. They were chosen so that they will love and obey the commandments of the Lord. You, we are chosen too for fellowship. We are chosen for obedience. We are chosen for worship. And we are chosen for service. We are chosen to be set apart, to be holy, and to be different from the world. The Christian has been chosen that he may be different from all the men and women around him, around her. The difference lies in the fact that we are now devoted to the work of God and we are dedicated to doing the will of God. All the people may follow the standards, the standards of the world or the priests and policies of society, but we as children of God will now follow the standard of the Lord alone. We consecrate ourselves to the part of God's peculiar people. 
It tells us in uh, these references of scriptures that you find in that outline that we are chosen. Number one scene, we are chosen. Let's look at, at John chapter 15 verse 16. John chapter 15 verse 16. You yeah, have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You see what the Lord was saying to the disciples? You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. And ordained you, I put you in place, that you should go and bring forth fruits, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. As we look at that, uh, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, number one, we're a chosen generation. Number two, we're a royal priesthood. We're royal priesthood. We're priests unto the Lord our God. Royal priesthood. We're kings and priests unto the Lord. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the priest of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, royal priesthood, royal priesthood, kings on the one hand, and also on the other hand, priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. In Isaiah chapter 26, Isaiah 26, reading from verse 2, Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. We are referred to as a holy nation, the righteous nation. How do we become the holy nation? The righteous nation. We come to the Lord through repentance, we are saved. After salvation, we consecrate, commit ourselves to the Lord, so He will purify us, make us holy, sanctify us, and then we become part of the holy, sanctified, righteous people of God, was sanctified by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. In um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, verse 26, verse 27. Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. Christ loved not just the world to give them salvation, he loved the church and he gave himself for the church. Why? For what reason? So that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The reason why Jesus made that sacrifice for the church is so that he will sanctify the church, purify the church, and cleanse the church. In verse 27, that he might present the church unto himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I pray the Lord will do it in us. He repents himself, a peculiar people. That's in Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus chapter 2, I'm going to go back to verse 11, so you get the whole picture. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11 through to verse 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us. We believe us, teaching us, we newborn babes in Christ, teaching us with lively stones, teaching us the holy nation, the royal priesthood, teaching us the holy and righteous generation, and then teaching us the peculiar people, teaching us that deny ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. And then we're waiting for the coming of the Lord, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He was fortunate who gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. Not just for them. He gave himself for them so that they might be saved. But for us so that we might be sanctified, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what he does. When Christ comes into our lives, he doesn't want us to just remain at the level of being saved, being born again. He wants us to move on and get sanctified and purified and live holy. Then we become zealous of good works. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 15. 
and verse 16. We're linking this up with 1 Peter chapter 2. The purpose why he has made us a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, is so that we'll show for the praises of him who has called us out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Here we're told in Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. That ye, should be, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We are now shining as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We are now lights, and our light will shine. I said our light will shine. We are supposed to shine as light. We are not to hide that light under a bushel. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But what's the use of the salt if it doesn't meet, doesn't season, the thing, the ingredients around it were the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, where we shall it be salted? It is then for good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill shall cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. We are going to give light unto all. In our neighborhood, our light will shine. In our communities, our light will shine. In our places of work, our light will shine. In the world around us, our light will shine. Then the people will come to know the Lord. We are told in verse 16, let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, who is in heaven. That's what the Lord wants us to do. He tells us in First Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The Lord wants us to offer spiritual sacrifices unto him. And if we're real Christians, and I believe we are, we're going to do exactly what the Lord has called us to do. We're called out of darkness. We're not to walk in the light. That is, in the believer's new life. We're not different from our former lives. We're not, the, as the light is different from darkness. We are now to show forth the praises of God in our lifestyle. And through God's transforming grace, we receive, those who have received Christ, and have received this grace in Christ, will not be able to live as the sons of God, shining as lights in the world, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. As we summarize, come back to First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. The Lord has been telling us and reminding us that if we're going to feel the position we're to feel, and we're going to be the people that has called us to be, there are things that we have to do. We do our part and then God will do his part. Many people are wondering why is it that we don't see the change, the transformation, the transforming power of the Lord in our lives. Because we are waiting for God to do everything. But you realize all, the Almighty God did not part the Red Sea until uh, Moses stretched out the rod. You have your part to play. And God has his part to play. And the Lord is waiting for you. You do your part and then the Lord will do his own part. You cannot divide the Red Sea, but you can stretch out the rod. And if you are waiting for the Lord to divide the Red Sea, except, except you and stretch out the rod, it will not happen. Do you remember while Moses was standing before that rod? If he does not strike the rod, as the Lord had told him, then the water will not come out of the rod. You cannot bring the water out of the rod, but you have a rod in your hand. And the Lord was telling Moses, you do what you will do, and then I will do what I will do. He struck the rock, and then the water came out. What if the people of Israel just, you know, stayed there expecting that God will make the Jericho walls to fall down? Except they went around, as the Lord told them to go around. 
The Jericho walls will not come down. You see, there are people that are, I don't know why I'm not living. I'm not living the well to live. I'm not shining as light. I'm not uh, beaming for the glory of God in my life. You are waiting too long. You are waiting for God to do everything. There are things you will do, and there are things God will do. You do your part, and then God will do His part. What's your part? Look at chapter two of First Peter, First Peter, chapter two, verse one. Wherefore, laying aside. That's verse one. If you don't lay aside, if you don't do your part, if you don't do what the Lord is calling you to do, you are a sinner, you have not been born again, the Lord is said, lay something aside, lay something apart, and then you will be born again, and the grace of God will come into your life. Or you are a believer, and these things are having enrolled into your life, lay them aside. And as you do that, and you do the human part, then the Almighty God will do the divine part. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all malice. Uh, you know, you know what, what this thing does when it says all malice? It means all malice. You know, there are people that say, okay, Lord, I've given up this, I've given up this, I've given up that. But it's just this one thing that I'm not, I'm not able to give up. And but the Lord said, give it up, lay it aside, all malice. You know, I don't know whether you are familiar with, you know, driving a vehicle. If you have a, you know, you have a vehicle, and then there are four tires on in that vehicle, and the brake is folding up firmly to just one tire. All the other three tires, they are, you know, they are already right, free. There's no brake on them. But the brake is folding onto just one tire. You know what's going to happen? You turn on the ignition, and then you put your, uh, you put your foot on the accelerator. Instead of moving forward, it will be spinning around that tire that is held on by the brake. The same thing, when you have a, a part of your life held on by the brake of malice, or by the brake of evil speaking, or guile, or hypocrisy, or maybe it is envy or jealousy, just that one area, you'll be spinning and spinning. You might apply the brake and apply the, apply, you know, atreto and gas and everything, the fasting and the praying and the reading of the Bible and everything you can do. You'll just be spinning on just one level. You will not move on. You will not grow. That's why the Lord is telling you. He says, lay aside. And except you do that part of yours that you're supposed to do, nothing is going to happen. You are going to discover that you'll be at that one spot. You'll be spinning in that one spot. All the praying, all the fasting, all the reading, all the whatever else you do, it's not going to amount to anything. That's why it says, lay everything aside. All, all malice, all evil speaking, all envies, all hypocrisy, and all God. Then, as newborn babes, desire. That's your part. That's something you can do. You can pick up the Word of God. You can read the Word of God. You can read all these expressions. You can listen to the messages. You, when you do that, you do your part. When you do the human part, then God will do the divine part, which you cannot do. It says, Design it is the same make of the world, that she may grow thereby. You cannot pick yourself to grow. But you can do this part that the Lord has told you to do. And when you do your part, then the Lord will make sure that you are growing, and we're going to grow in Jesus' name. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming. You see that you can come, you can come, you've come to the Lord for salvation, you can come to the Lord again and come for sanctification. And you can do your part in coming. That's why we spend time coming to the Lord in prayer. After we have listened to the word of God, you need to be sanctified. Come, get sanctified. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Come and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need something. Grace from the Lord. Faith from the Lord. Power from the Lord. From the Lord. Come. And it's when you come, He'll give it to you. The point I'm making is, there are many people that are waiting for God to do everything. He's not going to do everything because He's told us what to do as coming. As unto a living stone is allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up. Are built up. When you do your part, then the Lord will build you up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You offer. You offer. 
uh, you know, uh, you are there, uh, you, you have read the Bible before in 1st Kings chapter 18. When Elijah took the bullock and he caused his business, repaired the altar of the Lord, that's what you can do. That's what you ought to do. He couldn't bring the fire from heaven. God will bring the fire. But you do your part and you offer that spiritual sacrifice unto the Lord. It's when you do your part like that. The point I'm making is very important because, you see, I find many Christians waiting and waiting and waiting. They don't do anything. They're folding their hands and saying, Oh Lord, I'm here. Oh Lord, I'm here. Do this and do this. And God becomes our errand boy. It's to repay for us. It's to make a restitution for us. It's to do the praying for us. It's to run around for us. We do nothing. And we say, praise the Lord, I'm honoring God. I do nothing. He does everything. There's nothing like that in the Bible. You offer spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. It was when Elijah offered that sacrifice to the Lord, and the fire came down from heaven. And it is when you offer yourself, and you offer your body, a living sacrifice unto God. That's when the fire of the Lord will fall. I pray to start tonight. It says to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, a elect and precious. He that believeth, you see that? That's a part. You have to believe. He that believeth, the Lord tells us the words, they are the words of action, the things we have to do. And if when, when we do this, then he will do our part, his part. Then it says, if we do our part, he will do his part. Shall not be confounded unto you, therefore, which believe. You have to believe. It's precious. But unto them, which the disobedience, the, the stone, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them we stumble at the word, being disobedient, which whereunto also they were appointed, but here a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth, that you should show forth, show forth. you do it, you are not keep your, your life to yourself, your knowledge to yourself. Your grace to yourself, the divine ability that has been given to you to yourself, you show forth that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now thank God we are the people of God. We shall not obtain mercy, but thank God now we have obtained mercy. The Lord is calling us and is saying, You do your part, you have a part to play. And as you play your part tonight, the grace of God will be manifold and multiplied in your life in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up now. We're going to do our part. We're going to pray unto the Lord. And we're going to say, Lord, now we understand there's a human part, there's a divine part. And the Lord is saying, Do your part. And the Lord will readily, very quickly do his own part. Call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I've had your word. I know the challenge you are giving unto me so I can be the person, the man, the woman I ought to be. The believer that I ought to be. I just need to lay aside. Lay aside. The Lord is still saying that to me as he said in days gone by. Lay aside. Lay aside. If there are things in your life, if there are things in your heart, if there are things in your relationships, if there are things in your action, if there are things in your character, if there are things in your behavior, that you know the Lord is saying lay aside. You know, except you do that, they just be spinning around, around and around on that one point, and you will not be able to make a forward movement. But when you do what the Lord calls you to do, and you allow the will of God to swallow up your will, you allow the mind of God to reign without a rival in your mind. You allow the change that the Almighty God is expecting, you allow that change to come in your life. So that today is different from yesterday. This week is different from last week. This uh, month is different from last month. This year is different from last year. 
you are making progress, you are making progress in your Christian life, that she may grow thereby. Grow, spiritual growth. Growth in your personal life. Growth in your spiritual life. Growth in your ministerial life. Growth in your witnessing life. Growth in your Bible reading life. Growth in the obedient life. Coming unto the Lord. You came before, come again. You came for salvation before, now you can come for sanctification. You came confessing your sins, now you can come to consecrate your life. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Even after you are sanctified, keep coming. You can still come for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And you can come for grace to meet every need in your life, every challenge in your life. Keep coming to Christ. You have not exhausted the grace of God, the power of God, the love of God, the provision of God. Keep coming. Coming unto Him as a living stone. Approved of God, appointed by God, anointed by God, accepted by God. Then you become yourself a lively stone. A lively stone, not a dead stone. And you have a lively living effect on people around you. A living influence on people around you. A challenging influence on, on people around you. People will see your Christian life. They'll say, I want to follow Christ more. I want to have the grace I see in Brother Sansu's life. I want to have the gentleness, the love, the meekness, the faithfulness, the obedience I see in Sister Sansu's life. Be a lively stone, not isolated, not isolated, become part of the temple of God, part of this holy temple. Don't isolate yourself, don't cut off yourself, don't separate yourself. An isolated stone is not part of the building. We are the building of God. We are the temple of God. We built up a spiritual house. As a block in the building. As a stone in the building. Some buildings are going to be above you. Those sheets. Just because you don't want those stones above you. Some other stones are going to be beside you. Stay in your place. Other stones will be beneath you. Stay in your place. One stone does not make a temple. We need all the others around. So you can be part of that building. Part of that temple changed, cherished, chosen by God, and chiseled. Allow the Lord to chisel off, cut off the rough edges or the rough surface in your life. So you can be in the place He wants to put you. Let the Lord do His work. Don't resist Him. Don't argue with Him. Just go your own way. Let the Lord be God. He is the builder of His temple. Let the Lord be Lord. Let Him be the Lord. 
Let him do his work. Purge. Purify. Be holy. Sanctified. And then cemented, joined, united, and glued to the rest of the body. Accept the challenge. A part of the temple. Let the grace of God become more abundant in your life. So you are the spiritual, not carnal. Spiritual, not selfish. Spiritual, not worldly. And then you offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. Spiritual sacrifices are acceptable unto Him. Keep on believing in Christ, the chief cornerstone. No other foundation. This is the only foundation. All the foundation can no man lay than that which is already laid. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Remember, you are chosen for a purpose. To be a holy priesthood. Chosen for a purpose. To be a royal priesthood. Chosen for a purpose. To offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Chosen for a purpose. To show forth and shine forth the marvelous light of the Lord. The darkness is gone. And the light now shines. Let it shine. Let your light so shine before me. Don't hide the light. Don't put off the light. Let the light so shine before me. Let the people around you they see your good works. Let them see. And then they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's why you are going to win more converts to the Lord. Let your light shine. Live to the glory of God. Let the people around you see that grace, that glory, and the goodness of God in your life. Let people who know you see Christ to you. And let your life draw others to the Lord, that they too may be saved.